All right, what's happening guys? Welcome to another episode of Sensible Investing. My name is Jesse, and today we're going to cover a very interesting stock, which I believe is a good play on both the upcoming uh, 5G revolution and also a play on connectivity uh, as people's usage will continue to pick up, okay? So you guys might be wondering, oh, 5G, I thought, I thought it would have been AT&T or Verizon or Sprint or one of the chip makers but it's a, it's a company that, you know, it's, it's relatively unheard of. I mean, Boingo Wi-Fi, right? So for all of my American watches, you guys might be uh, familiar with Boingo because you guys might know them from when you travel, for example, at the airport, and then you get the airport Wi-Fi that's usually supplied by Boingo. Um, however, the thing is that it's a, it's a lot more than that, right? So Boingo Wi-Fi is a lot more than just airport Wi-Fi. It goes a lot deeper, and there's a lot more areas that this company is touching that uh, we're not even aware of. So that's why I thought it'd be interesting to bring this analysis to you today. Now, before we get into Boingo, we, we first have to understand what it is, what it does, and what it means, okay? So in effect, Boingo is a provider of DAS networks, or distributed antenna systems, all right? Now, um, why is this significant and why is this important for 5G? Well, to simply put it, uh, the reason why this is important is because with 5G, we want more speeds, right? We want more speeds, more bandwidth, more everything. We want it quick, we want it now. However, the problem is, in order to transmit uh, this much data in such a, a short amount of time, we have to increase the frequencies of the radio waves that get passed around, okay? So if you guys imagine their networks and their radio waves flying from different places, carrying different types of data, you know, you've got your emails, your pictures, your videos, and whatnot. Um, in order to increase the speeds, we have to increase the frequency. But the problem with that is, as we increase the frequency and the speeds, its ability to travel distances decreases and also its ability to penetrate solid matter decreases. Okay, so, so what this means is that uh, the higher the speed and the higher the frequency, the, the less it'll travel and the less its ability to actually get to you. For example, if you're inside a building or if you're inside uh, public transport or if you're just pretty much inside anywhere, the radio waves have to somehow get to your device that's consuming the data, for example, streaming, okay? And this is why a DAS system is important, because what the DAS system does is that it helps to, I, I, I guess it acts as an extension to the actual um, radio tower or, or the actual uh, originator of the frequency, okay? So if you guys can imagine you're in a big city, and as you guys can see here, let's say where my mouse is, is where the uh, frequencies originate from, well, in order to get from one end of the city to the other end of the city, it needs to touch different nodes in order to not lose its uh, speed, because, like I said before, it can't travel as far if it's faster and has higher frequency, and that's exactly why you need DAS systems, which acts as an extension for the frequency over great distances and trying to penetrate through solid matter, okay? It, now, if all of the providers were to try and build their own DAS systems, uh, that, that would be problematic in many ways, okay? First of all, it's going to create a planning challenge or a hazard for the government or the, you know, whether it's the federal or the state government, the, the different sort of uh, town governments, okay? Because visually, it's going to be unattractive and uh, it's going to create a lot of clutter. And secondly, it's going to create a lot of uh, capex and a lot of disruption. Because if you can imagine each of the providers setting up their own DAS networks and then needing to set up, you know, we're talking thousands and thousands of antennas, nodes, uh, little DAS systems all across the city, that's going to be an absolute planning nightmare, okay? And that is why a carrier neutral provider of DAS systems is needed. Because if we go to the next page, and look at the image here, and if you can imagine that this is a very simplified layout of um, what types of DAS networks is needed to enhance the strength of the signal, 
being passed through the city, through the buildings from the original radio tower, then multiply that by four, then multiply all of the infrastructure that's needed, like the uh, you know the wiring, the cabling, you know all of the the the, the uh, antennas and all of that. It's just going to be an absolute nightmare. Um, you know, let, not not to mention that this is for outdoors. But then if we look at indoors, and then we look at you know each provider setting up their own network, multiply that by four, and obviously you guys can see that it's not feasible. And so as a result, this is where somebody like Boingo Wireless comes in because they're a carrier neutral provider of DAS networks. It allows the uh, governments and the municipalities to get what they want in terms of uh, by creating DAS networks to give everybody faster speeds, faster data, faster transfer, faster everything without the expense of uh, making it a planning light nightmare, um, overloading in terms of the amount of hardware that needs to be put up and minimizing disruption rather than putting up four or five sets of DAS systems you just put up one set and so that's that's sort of the value proposition for Boingo because if we have a look at their coverage you actually realize that they are uh, the USA's largest operator of indoor DAS networks however like I said at the beginning of the video you probably never heard of these guys before but if we look at the map over here you can see that not only do they have a large network of active um, DAS networks and systems, but the fact is that uh, the amount that they have in their pipeline is also equally big, right? So you can uh, you guys can see my uh, excitement, sort of excitement in this opportunity. Uh, furthermore, this then allows somebody like Boingo to charge not just one carrier, but all of the carriers, right? So your AT&Ts, your Verizons your Sprints, your T-Mobiles, uh, fees, because the fact that they have built these networks, right, they can charge access fees, they can charge maintenance fees, they can charge upgrade fees. So so this this is where the value proposition comes in. So, so they're not just a play on, you know, wireless systems or Wi-Fi, but in fact they're a play on the entire 5G movement as a whole, benefiting not just from one carrier, but from all carriers. And as you guys can see from the uh, graphs over here, you, you can see that they've been growing their pipelines very steadily, very consistently. Uh, you know, they've been winning new business, and they've really been growing their core value propositions in a few areas. Now, if we look at the graph towards the bottom right, you guys can see that uh, about sort of, you know, eight, nine years ago, retail what was quite a large component of their revenue. But what they quickly realized was that they can be a lot more profitable and, a, and grow a lot faster if they target certain niches. And so as a result, you can see that their DAS revenue has grown exponentially. But what's even more interesting is that if you look at their uh, military and multifamily revenue, that, that's grown even more, right? That's gone from virtually uh, non-existent to their greatest revenue generator. And so if we think back to this picture over here, this picture here with the indoor Wi-Fi, that's effectively an indoor multifamily uh, DAS system, i.e., you know, like I touched on before, because the faster speeds have problems penetrating solid matter, um, what, what I'm anticipating is that pretty much every big urban building, whether it's an office building or whether it's a multi-story unit, or if you can imagine a standard uh, army barracks, right? It's very similar to, to, to an apartment building, right? The soldiers need connectivity, the people living in there need connectivity, and as a result, uh, that's where Boingo comes in. And, and so that explains why their multifamily uh, military revenue has grown so fast. And, and now they've got a very dominant market share. I think they've got about sort of 40-odd percent market share with, with very, very good uh, margins in the military space, okay? And not only are they consistently growing uh, their revenues and their wins, they're, they're actually significantly outperforming their competitors. So as you guys can see, based on their wins, because I suspect how they derive this data is that they go in and bid for these projects, and I'll show you something a little bit later on in the video, which actually confirms um, this pie graph, where they uh, are much more likely to win business over their competitors, just because of their expertise and their knowledge and the fact that they've been doing this for 
you know, basically longer than anyone else and specializing in this particular niche, I believe that the win rates will continue forward. And that's another uh, bullish indicator for Boingo. Okay, so there's a lot of good things happening for this company. So at this point, you guys might be wondering, well, if everything's so good, uh, why does the market hate Boingo, right? So yes, it went up, but now it's practically fallen back down to, you know, three, four year lows, almost at the, you know, pretty close to the near all time lows that they were trading at back in 2014, 2015. So at this point, you guys might be wondering, well, you know, why does the market hate the stock? You know, what what's caused it to sell off? Um, you know, why do they trade in a depressed state for so long when they IPO'd? What caused them to go up? Why have they come back down? And, uh, and, and you know, what's their future going forward? And so what we're going to do is we're going to answer all of these questions uh, now in this video. So to answer these questions, guys, I've written a 16-page report on Boingo. Now, I would say that my report is about 70% complete, and what I have to do now is to, in the final 30%, project what I believe is um, a reasonable exit price for Boingo based on their next, uh, I guess, uh, two, three, four, five, six earnings calls where I think the revenue, EBITDA, and earnings are going to be, and then what the market's willing to pay for them. So guys, if you like a copy of the report, make sure to smash that like button, subscribe, let, and leave a comment. If we can get this video to 50 likes, then I'll make sure to upload a link uh, with, with the report in my next video. Okay guys, so let's get into it. So in this report, we're going to answer, as we saw before, the questions below. Starting with why Boingo share price stagnated for so long after its IPO. Okay, and guys, the answer to this question is very simple. Boingo is a very disruptive company. However, they were too early in the game, okay? And I would say that they were, uh, you know, sort of four, five, even six years too early. And the reason being is because if we uh, think back to what happened during 2014, 2015, okay? Netflix didn't really start becoming popular until the end of 2015 in, in terms of really mainstream, okay? We're talking like mainstream, mainstream, you know, where memes of Netflix and chill came out, okay, guys? Uh, the second thing is YouTube didn't reach over a billion global users until, like I said, it was around about mid-2015. Um, finally, what really catalyzed this sort of streaming, um, I, I guess, fanaticism is the fact that if we think back to when iPhone actually released their iPhone 6, okay, so it was a 4G enabled smartphone with pretty much, you know, unlimited screen space and really nothing unnecessary apart from screen space, okay? So if we combine all of this, then we'll actually realize that the increase in the need for these DAS systems increased uh, proportional to how streaming increased, the use of data consumption increased, and also the adoption of smartphones with streaming abilities and other devices like you know your tablets and whatnot increased. Okay, guys. Now this was actually even uh, highlighted by the CEO when he actually stated that look, Boingo is actually a play on these devices. Okay. However, this was back in 2002, and he was just a bit too early. If we look at the graphs below, we'll actually see that it makes sense. Okay. Uh, the way that Boingo's share price moved. In, in comparison to how the adoption of 4G moved and the ex exponential adoption rate of 4G, it, it, it actually does make sense, okay? So if we look at this graphs here, you can see that 4G didn't really peak until the end of 2016. And then if we compare that to their share, share price, we'll actually realize that towards here, which is, sorry, towards here, which, as you guys can see, end of 2016, beginning of 2017, that's when it really started to take off, okay? So there's a very, very good correlation between the adoption of 4G and, and how the share price took off. Now, if we think about the rate at which 4G was adopted, which was four times faster than 3G, then we think about 5G and people's demand for more, we can kind of project why I'm so bullish about Boingo going into 2020, 21, and 22 and beyond. Um, 
Now, I'm just going to skip through a lot of this report because it's quite long, but what I really wanted to do was to also take you through from a numbers point why sentiment reversed so, so sharply and sent Boingo share price flying, okay? Now, now, in order to do that, what we'll do is we'll have a look at the table. And I've highlighted in light blue exactly when and how and why the share price went up, okay? So it was a combination of them accelerating the growth rates from sort of the low to mid-teens to the, you know, high 20s, and, and at one point it even exceeded 30, okay? And in conjunction with that, the other key metrics were also increasing, okay? So we're talking the number of connects per quarter, the number of, you know, core military subscribers, which is their bread and butter, high margin stuff, even while retail was de declining, okay? Because they were so niched in the space that there weren't any other players in that space that they effectively had a almost a monopoly, okay? They had their access fees, their revenues, you know, the number of nodes, the nodes in the backlog, it was all going up. And in addition to this, um, they, they were actually upgrading their guidance, you know, heavily, right? So if we now look at the graph over here, you can see that, you know, at the start, they were maintaining their guidance, you know, they were maintaining their guidance, maintaining their guidance, and then all of a sudden, you can see that they've actually, there, there, there were many multiple quarters of guidance raises, okay, so we're talking quarter after quarter, and furthermore, not only did they raise their guidance, but they kept beating their own guidance, so what, what you had was that you had a company that was issuing guidance, raising their guidance, outperforming their own guidance, then raising it again, and then that compounded, okay, so as a result, guys, you can see that the share price just went absolutely through the roof at this point, because Everybody was getting so bullish, they're like, oh, this is the next big thing, they're going to disrupt the market, this is a, um, you know, this is the, this is it for 5G, etc, etc, okay? So there was a lot of exuberance at the time. Now, the problem with this is that when people start getting too exuberant, then what happens is, well, uh, you know, expectations get too high, and then they end up getting missed, and, and that's part of the reason why it sent the stock back down, okay guys? So what we're going to cover next, guys, is uh, first of all, what caused the sentiment to change and send the stock back down? Um, and, and what were the main drivers of, of, you know, the stock falling off a cliff and effectively going back to its lows, you know, sort of three, four years ago? Um, and, and whether this was justified or not, okay? And so the first reason why the stock price went back down as quick as it went up was because, like I said before, uh, you know, expectations got far too ahead of itself, okay? So the company was guiding this much of revenue, but the Wall Street was like, no, they're going to beat guidance again, you know, but the problem with Wall Street is they're not industry insiders, okay? They don't know how the company works, and they don't know the economics. All they know is just how to project stuff, and most of the time it's wrong. And so as a result, that came... Uh, you know, that, that sort of caused their first drop. So as you guys can see over here, that caused the first sell-off over there when uh, the company would effectively miss expectations even though they were outperforming their own expectations, not the street's expectations, okay? So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Now, the second thing was that, the second thing that caused the sharp sell-off was on their February 2019 earnings call, um, now, the CEO said, look, they were going to take a revenue hit in 2019 for 7.2 points, okay? That's massive. So 720 basis points of revenue hit. Um, and also a 1,960 basis point EBITDA hit, okay? And the reason being is because, and this is how their business model works. Now, uh, if you know the business, you won't actually panic because you realize that it doesn't actually mean anything. But if you're somebody just viewing from the outside and you bought the massive run-up and then all of a sudden this is happening, the, you know, your typical panic, okay? And as a result, you know, Wall Street panicked, everybody panicked, and as you can see, the, the, the thing got sold off again, okay? So, uh, sorry, the, the thing got sold off again, okay? Over here. Now, the, the thing is extending big, big customer contracts, okay? Because 
the contract that they were extending, it was huge. It was one of their top five clients, okay? And as a result, the term of the contract increased, the value of the contract increased, but then the way that they recognized the revenue, obviously on a per year, per quarter basis, it, it naturally had to decrease uh, because you know the, the term was effectively twice as long as the original term, okay? And the CEO even said, he said, look, the market's got a goldfish memory because we do this every year, right? This was a big, massive client. We did this last year, and last year we took about a $12 million EBITDA hit, which was about 17 odd points, uh, you know? So I don't know why everybody's panicking about this this year, okay, guys? Like, this is just common practice, right? You know, these are two big airports. We've effectively doubled the term that they signed up for. We've locked them in for another five, 10 years. Uh, hence why we have had to amortize our revenue over a longer period. I don't know why you guys are panicking, okay? And, and so as a result, if we actually look at this graph over here, what happened was the market sold it off and then eventually the stock went up to make new highs because again, they kept on outperforming their own expectations, okay? And so, as you guys can see here, again, this was, um, you know, I, I don't think that this was justified because the business was healthy, okay? The pipeline was healthy, the backlog was healthy, everything was healthy, okay? So, at this point, you guys might be wondering, okay, well, that's cool, but then why did the share price go down over here, not to, only to not recover, and now it's at, you know, in the depths of hell, okay? Like, what, what happened this time around? And the, the answer to that question is really simple, okay? So, if you guys have a look at this graph over here, actually we'll go to this one, the guidance table, okay? So you can see that, you know, the company has only ever beat their own guidance and they've never missed guidance. However, the problem with that was that in Q3, sorry, in Q2, they issued guidance for Q3, and on the face of it, it would actually look like, oh, hang on, are they are they going backwards? Like, what, what's going on here, you know? But... But we have to be very careful and pay attention to the full-year guidance that they issued. And the fact is that they maintained their full-year guidance, but they gave Q3 guidance. Okay, And again, if you're not familiar with the company and you're looking in from the outside, it would actually look like the company won't actually make their full-year numbers because Q3 was so weak. Okay, And so as a result, this again caused Wall Street to panic people sold the stock off, you know, everybody just sort of went a little bit mad, okay? And and now, you guys might be thinking, well, you know, will they meet their Q3 guidance? Uh, you know, what, what what's going on here? So, if we calculate the run rate uh, based on what they've achieved in Q1 and Q2, and what they say they'll achieve in Q3, you can see why there was so much skepticism, because uh, Wall Street's like, okay, so you're going to have a sequential quarter-on-quarter quarter decline from Q2 to Q3, and you, you're telling us that you're actually going to then not only turn your fortunes around, but had an all-time record for your Q4, okay? And so that's why they were really skeptical, all right? Now, guys, I won't go too much into it because I've quoted, you know, basically pages and pages and paragraphs and paragraphs from the earnings call. So if you guys actually want to uh, understand, you know, why I'm not too worried, then you know, have a look at the earnings calls or smash that like button and I'll send out my report. But you can see that Wall Street's in fact said, look, we actually think the company's going to miss their own guidance, okay? Because as you can see above, the company is guiding 270 to 280 for the full year and Wall Street's going, no, 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 this is not gonna happen, okay? We think they're actually gonna come in at 270. So basically, Wall Street thinks the company's going to miss their own guidance and come in at the very low end, or, or in some cases, you know, miss their own guidance, okay? But if we do a deep dive into the earnings call and we just have a look at, you know, how healthy their backlogs are, how healthy that their sales pipeline is, you know, how healthy everything is, and the fact that, you know, they already said, look, quarter three is a natural low point for the business and it's nothing out of the ordinary because, you know, this is just how our deferred revenue amortization works when we renew customer contracts, especially massive customer contracts, then you guys will actually see that it's, you know, it's, it's actually nothing to worry about because all of the other metrics, okay guys, and we're not going to deep dive too much into these quotes because we've got sort of four massive pages of quotes, okay, but this is basically management saying, hey guys, look, 
you know, our pipelines are healthy, we've got very high win rates, you know, we, we've just won one of the biggest deals we've ever won, which is the MTA Association of New York, which was 20 times larger than our standard deals, you know, military is healthy, our node backlog is healthy, our venue pipeline is healthy, everything is healthy, guys, we're, we're going to make our 20, uh, sorry, we're going to meet our Q4 and full year guidance numbers, okay? But as you guys can see with the share price, Wall Street clearly doesn't believe them, okay? So Wall Street, you know, the, the sentiment is just very, very negative, despite all of the evidence pointing to the contrary, okay, guys? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to skip through because these are all quotes from management, all right? So at this point, guys, you might be wondering, okay, cool, so the business is doing fine, but, um, you know, what's going to turn the sentiment around? And when is it actually going to materialize, okay? And guys, the answer to your question is actually, you know, very, very simple. So if we focus on this paragraph over here, um, based on my research, I believe that the turning point for Boingo will be Q3 and Q4 of this year, okay? Now, I believe that there's going to be a small turning point in Q3 where they will again reaffirm and maintain their guidance for the full year, um, let alone, you know, talk to everybody about how healthy everything is. But furthermore, um, I believe that in Q4, they're going to issue their guidance for 2021, and the growth rates are actually going to resume uh, going back above 15%. Like I believe we'll send the stock price back up when they give guidance uh, in Q4 for their 2021 numbers, okay? 2020 numbers, sorry. Okay, guys, and as we covered at the start of the video, the growth rates... Uh, slowing slowing down, that was actually uh, because they had renewed their customers and they had to amortize the renewed revenue over a longer period, hence there was a bit of revenue deferral, okay guys? So we actually covered that that wasn't going to be a problem, um, and it's not like it's going to happen every year because they've only got, you know, four or five massive customers like the big airports. Okay, so as a result, guys, what I think is going to happen is I think that they're going to meet their Q4 guidance, or even potentially exceed it, okay? Because if we look at their numbers, you'll actually realize that consistently, quarter four, year on year, and, and it's never never been any different for the last, you know, four years, has always been a lot greater than quarter one in terms of revenue, okay? And that's just how their business model works. So you can see 2015, a lot bigger, okay? 2016, a lot bigger. 2017, a lot bigger. And then 2018, it wasn't a lot bigger, but it was still quite a lot, quite a bit bigger. So as a result, based on past performance, if nothing has changed, i.e. the pipelines are still healthy, which they are, you know, the, the backlogs are still healthy, everything is healthy, then we can assume that, you know, if the business model hasn't changed, it's unlikely that their uh, pattern of quarter four being quite a bit larger than quarter one is going to change. So as a result, what I've done is I've done I've done the following, okay? So I've averaged out what the average is, and on average, quarter four's revenue is 27.06% more than quarter one, okay? But having said that, even if we do a worst case scenario and we say, okay, quarter four is only going to be 16.59% greater than quarter one, you can see that they will still meet their own guidance. Because over here, you guys can see that if we look at the run rate, okay, and we assume that they achieve midpoint of their guidance for quarter three, then add the worst case scenario revenue of 77 and a half million, they'll actually meet their guidance of 270 to 280 million for the full year, as a result showing the market that, you know, oh, things aren't that bad and sentiment was just, I, I guess, unjustified, okay? But in the best case scenario, they would actually beat their own guidance, and, and this is what's going to, you know, partially send the share price upwards, okay? And so in order to reinforce that, again, I've uh, got some extracts over here from management's comments on the earnings calls, and uh, we're not going to do a deep dive into that, but um, like I said, if you guys want to have a look, um, you know, have a look at the earnings calls yourselves, or smash that like button, get this video to 50 likes, and then I'll release a copy of the report. All right, guys, and finally, to wrap up the video, because we've covered a lot, you guys might be wondering, okay, well, that's cool. So we know when the stock's potentially going to, you know, 
its fortunes are going to turn for the better and we understand what the catalysts are and we understand that the business is healthy so you might be wondering well what's the actual revenue going to be in 2020 and 2021 um what's the EBITDA going to be what are their earnings you know what, what what's everything going to be okay and guys that's why i said at the beginning of the video this report isn't 100 percent complete because this is what i'm doing at the moment is actually working that out okay and you guys might be wondering well how are you going to work that out like you know you you you, you didn't cover any information and this is the company's proprietary trade secrets you know how are you actually going to work that out okay guys and the answer to your question is actually quite simple so what i've done here if you have a look at these two documents okay document one this pdf and document two this pdf now what i've actually done as I've done a lot of deep digging and I've actually managed to find their commercial terms okay so full commercial terms we're talking you know revenue kickback margins spend you know all of that stuff for the MTA deal which was recently signed back in 2018 and going back 20 something plus years this was the deal that they signed with the Port Authority uh, you know of of uh, of of or New York, right? Which was one of their key customers because one of their key customers that was renewed was the JFK Airport. And in these documents, it actually has the full commercial terms, okay? So we're talking, you know, what they signed, how long it was, how much was it for, what it was year on year, etc., etc., um, which will then allow us to reverse engineer what the deal could have potentially been and then project it forward, including things like, you know, CPI, inflation adjustments, and, and all of that stuff, um, you know, moving forward. And so the fact that we have two of their flagship deals, and if we think back over here to the earnings calls, uh, the CEO and CFO actually said, look, the MTA deal, uh, let me just find that actually. Okay. The MTA deal is actually equivalent of 20 of our standard DAS deals, okay? Now, obviously, we can't get it to the sort of, you know, pinpoint degree of accuracy, but what we can understand is that, you know, to a relatively accurate level, we can actually understand, okay, so we know what the commercial terms are, and we know how much they'll make from these two deals. So, therefore, we probably know what their margins are, and we can actually work out the revenues you know, that we think that they're going to get these deals, right? You know, how much is it going to increase per year? What's the initial charge? You know, what's the kickback, right? What's the capex? So if you guys actually, you know, have a look at these two links, which again, I've included in my report, um, so smash that like button, get it to 50 likes, and I'll send it out to all of you guys. You know, you can actually see we've got the full commercial terms of the deal, right? And this, so this will actually allow us to reverse engineer what the deal's worth, then divide that by 20, which will allow us to get to an average standard DAS deal. Then we work out what the, you know, one, two, three, four year average in terms of win rates. Okay, so we're talking number of deals won, number of deals deployed, number of deals in the backlog. And this, this will actually help us to project their 2020 and 2021 revenues and profits and margins and beyond okay and and so this is why I said guys look the re report is not 100% complete because this is what I'm working on at the moment and let me tell you it is a shitload of work trying to re reverse engineer deals and project okay but the good thing is that we know how much um, first of all we know how long roughly a typical deal is in terms of number of years and then we sort of know you know what the economics of this are Okay, guys, so so that's that sort of 2020, 2021 and beyond. All right, and then to summarize the video, guys, with the risks. Okay, so what, what, what are the risks of this? Uh, you know, because obviously every investment has risks. Well, the first risk is that they will miss their Q3 earnings number. Now, Boingo, in, in their sort of four years that I've looked back, four or five years, they've actually never, ever missed their guidance once, okay? So the likelihood is low, but it does exist. And if they miss their guidance, well, this thing's going to get sold off, right? Um, second of all, if they they downgrade their Q4 guidance at the Q3 earnings call because they're like, oh, shit, guys, we're actually not going to meet the guidance even though we reiterated it. Again, the likelihood is low, 
and based on how healthy their pipelines are, this is very, very low. But again, that's a, that, that's, that's a real risk, okay, guys? So, you know, we have to keep this in mind. Now, there, there are some also potential hidden upsides as well. And, and one of them is that, look, as you guys can see here, they've appointed a, you know, quite a big fish who used to be at Verizon, who specialized in mergers and acquisitions, okay? And you guys might be thinking, well, they probably just appointed this guy to try and buy up other small companies. Well, hang on a second. Well, they acquired one of their biggest acquisitions they've ever done back in, you know, 2017, 2018, in the absence of this guy. So why do they need that, okay? So this gets me thinking, okay? Are other big fish seeing this company being mispriced and seeing the value in this company? And could this be a potential acquisition target at a healthy premium? Who knows, right? But in order to support that, look, I think yes. The reason being is because if we focus on this paragraph over here, you can see that the selection committee, okay, so this paragraph here. So what it tells us is that these guys are very good at what they do. They're very specialized in their niche. And, you know, they're definitely not the cheapest, but yet they still win deals, which then corroborates, if we go back into here, the slide over here, they've got a 42% win rate versus their competitors, okay? So this really corroborates with the fact that, look, they're outperforming the market. That's why their pipelines are so healthy. You know, that's why they're winning these big deals. I think that the, biz the business is going to do well over the long term, okay? And again, guys, look, this is my analysis. Um, it's important to remember to always do your own research and, uh, you know, form your own opinion. But um, in short, look, I'm quite bullish about this company. So what I plan to do is as soon as I finish projecting the, you know, sort of 2020, 2021 potential revenues and beyond, um, I'm, you know, looking to probably initiate a position of about one and a half to two percent of my portfolio to start and then doubling that to, you know, maybe 3 or 4% and then not exceeding that as, um, you know, I believe that there is really good value in this company. All right, guys, so a bit of a really long video today, but um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Look, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into this. So, um, yeah, if you can share the video to anyone else who might find it useful, be really appreciated. And again, feel free to leave your comments below. Get this video to 50 likes, and then I'll send you guys a copy of my report, okay? Until next time, happy investing. Have a good weekend.